Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for this special Halloween edition for true scary stories to help you fall asleep. I hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, please enjoy these true Halloween scary stories. This is going to be a pretty tame story compared to a lot of the great ones that I've read on here. But since it happened to me, I think it's pretty spooky. I'm definitely buying a doorbell camera ASAP. I'm writing this only a few hours after everything happened. Now that I've calmed down and the sun is coming up and I feel somewhat safer. Last night, I was laying in bed, reading a little before I went to sleep. I think it's important to clarify that I live on the outskirts of my town. Still in town, but definitely on the edge. Off the highway that leads out of town and into about a 15 mile long stretch of lots of country. Woods, fields, a few residences, but mostly open highway. So other than the other tenants in my actual apartment building, it's normally very quiet in my area. My building is a square with four apartments. And for each of us, our door simply faces out into the open but there's no lobby or foyer or anything. My door in particular looks out into a large field that goes up a hill. I don't remember the exact time, but sometime between 1 to 2 a.m., someone randomly started banging on my door, which freaks me out at the best of times in broad daylight, but especially in the middle of the night. I nervously went to ask who it was, and this guy with a deep voice claimed that he was a police officer and that I needed to let him in. That's what he said. I needed to let him in, not that I needed to open the door. Luckily, I watch and listen to a lot of true crime stuff, so I got pretty suspicious real quick. I just got near instant alarm bells because he couldn't tell me why I needed to let him in, what I supposedly did, and he never even asked what my name was. So he also didn't really sound like a cop, if you know what I mean. Obviously, I was feeling creeped out, so I called 911 to confirm that there was actually an officer at my address, and they said there wasn't. At this point, I'm freaking out, and I kind of call out through the door that I'm on the phone with the police, and the guy just kind of bangs on my door one more time, then stops making noise. I presume because he ran off at this point. They dispatched two cars to my apartment, and the officers took a good look around. Unfortunately, the guy was long gone by the time they got there. And I never saw him, so I don't have a description of him or anything. But the cops did say two things to make me feel better. One, they'd post more patrols in my area over Halloween weekend. And two, it was most likely a Halloween prank, because the bar down the street from my apartment had had a party, and it just closed not too long before. Anyway, trust your instincts. And remember that if you have any doubts about someone claiming to be a police officer, call 911 and confirm that they are who they say they are. Dispatch and the officers who came tonight told me that you will not get in trouble for making sure the person that you're talking to is actually an officer. This also applies to situations where it's nighttime and dark, so you can't really see for sure if it's a real cop car behind you or not. If you see flashing lights behind you on a back road or dark area at night, put on your hazard lights and call 911 first to make sure it's actually a police car. You won't get in trouble, and it's better to be safe than sorry. This happened when I was 12 and my brother was 17 and is truly proof that the living are more terrifying than the dead. I think about this every Halloween. This is not a paranormal story. The community I grew up in was made up mostly of Hispanic people. So the folklore of La Llorona was very popular in the area and especially around Halloween. For those of you who don't know the curse of La Llorona is basically a story about a woman who married a rich man and had a perfect life, and then the man cheated on her. 
She was so distraught that she took her children to the river and drowned them. When she realized what she had done, she threw herself in the river and drowned herself. But she couldn't pass on the afterlife without her children. So, she roams the river looking for her kids. If she spots living children, she will grab them and drown them to take them to the afterlife with her. The story is meant to keep kids from playing in the river. Most of my friends that year were too cool and grown up to go trick-or-treating that year, and were planning on having a party instead. I was really disappointed and asked my brother if he would take me trick-or-treating. He agreed, and we went while it was still light outside, so I would be able to make it to the party before the end of the night. Since we had gone too early, there weren't a lot of people ready to hand out candy, so after a disappointing trek, we started walking back home. On our way home, we passed by a park that had a river running next to it. On Halloween, older teens would usually wait at this park to try and see if they could spot La Llorona. Waiting to spot La Llorona at this particular park was a well-known town tradition that people had done for decades that still continues to this day. However, there were no kids or teens there yet because it was still kind of early, but there were people in the park putting on a La Llorona play. We decided to stop and watch it. There was really not much of an audience. It seems like it was just us and another few kids who were a part of the group putting on the play, who were not in costumes and didn't have trick-or-treating buckets with them. When we sat down, a woman approached us and asked us if we were trick-or-treating. I told her that we were, and she dropped a small comic book in my trick-or-treat bag and smiled. She seemed very kind and welcoming. The play started, and I got a weird feeling that something was off. The woman playing La Llorona pointed my brother and me out in the tiny audience and asked us what religion we were, to which my brother responded Roman Catholic. She then told us that La Llorona was also a Roman Catholic and was burning in hell for her sins and rejecting Jesus. She then told us that Halloween was an evil holiday and everyone who celebrated it would burn forever. The play progressed to getting weirder and weirder and including a scene where La Llorona started talking about abortion and held up a fake fetus and pretended to eat it. My brother and I got up to leave, but the people stopped us and started yelling at us to sit down, but we just kept going. They started following us down the street, and my brother grabbed my hand and started running because he was afraid that they were going to harm us. We finally got to our street, and only about three people were still following us, yelling at us about how we were going to hell, and we needed to accept Jesus. My brother and I went inside quickly, and he locked the front doors then frantically ran around the house making sure all doors and windows were locked before he called our dad at his office. Our dad told us to call the police and that he'd be home in 15 minutes. When my dad got home, the people were still outside, chanting and singing some prayer song, asking God to save my brother and my soul. My dad shooed them away and told them the police would be there any second. They were not deterred and stayed there chanting until the police showed up and threatened to arrest them. I was so freaked out by the events that I decided I didn't want to go to the party and instead just wanted to organize my Halloween candy and put aside all my Snickers for my brother as a thank you for taking me trick-or-treating. Snickers were his favorite. My mom ordered pizza and we sat down to watch Halloween Town while I went through my trick-or-treat bag. I was halfway through sorting my candy when I came across the comic book that the lady dropped in there. I opened it up and it truly horrified me. It was a propaganda comic about how a little boy went to a haunted house, ended up being hit by a car on the way home, and went to hell because he hadn't found Jesus. I was really scared, and for weeks as a child, I had nightmares about the event in the comic book. Years later, I asked my mom if she remembered it, and she told me that she couldn't forget, and that she and my father had called the police over it several times. Apparently, for years, The group would leave envelopes with mine and my brother's name written on it with different weird creepy comic books and handwritten notes about how they were praying for us. Also, invitations to join them in their church and weird promises about baking us cakes and other creepy ways to entice our child selves into their church. To this day, we can't figure out how they knew our names or who wrote the letters. It really creeps me out that they did this.
This happened just a few hours ago. I have called and reported it to the police, and I am home safely, but I guess I'm still in shock. I could do with putting it down in writing to process it, and figured this is as good a place as any to share what happened. I finished work early today, so I decided to go out for a run. I set out around 4.30 and decided that my usual routes, which crossed many roads, would not be very practical. So, I took an alternate route along a canal town path and some pathways through woods that I knew would be less busy. Everything was going well. I was pushing myself steady until I got to a pathway on the back around 6 kilometers into the route. It's a long straight path with a canal on the left. And on their right, there is wasteland where some factories used to be but they've mostly been demolished. It's been left abandoned for as long as I can remember, and is overgrown with trees and weeds. But there are odd bits of an old factory that, for some reason, weren't fully demolished. As I got level with one part of the factory, which still had some old metal fire escape steps attached to it, I noticed a rough-looking guy sat on the wall with his legs hanging down. He jumped to his feet as he saw me coming, and shouted something, but I couldn't make it out. As I came level to where he was, I heard him say, Wait there, can you help me find my phone? He said this while he was running down the steps. So, I stopped as I got level with where the bottom of the steps were, meaning that we were standing just a few feet apart, but with a fence in between us. It was a really old iron fence with vertical metal bars that have spikes on the top like you sometimes see around churches and things. He asked me if I would help him find his phone, saying that he had dropped it somewhere nearby and asked if I could ring his number so that he could listen for it. I felt that I couldn't exactly refuse as my phone was strapped to my arm, so I said, could he tell me the number, and I took my phone off my arm and unlocked it. He blurted out a phone number but said it far too fast, and it didn't begin with 07, which made me start to feel like something wasn't right. Although I was beginning to suspect at this point, I wasn't really worried. I'm in pretty good shape, had a big size and weight advantage over him, plus there was a fence between us. He didn't seem in very good physical shape and seemed like he might be homeless. I figured if he was trying to mug me for my phone, his only chance would be if he pulled a knife. So I made sure to stay a good distance away from the fence and kept my eye on where his hands were. So I told him I didn't catch any of the numbers because he said it too quickly. And he came out with another number. This time it did have 07 at the beginning. I entered seven numbers, and then he started to look around, saying, I can hear it, come help me look, as he looked around at the ground. I was about to say that I hadn't even finished dialing when a much larger guy appeared from behind a section of wall to my right. He was also really scruffy looking, and from the look of his eyes, it seemed like he was on drugs. He came out saying that he could hear the phone ringing over towards him, and beckoned me to come through a gap in the fence and help look. The first guy then said, It is ringing, yeah? And I told him it was, even though I still hadn't even dialed the last digits. And now, I was sure that they were trying to lure me to come over to that side of the fence. After two or three times of them both beckoning me to come and help, always insisting that they could hear the ring, I heard the second guy say, he's not going to fall for it. He said it in a hushed way as if he thought that I wouldn't hear, but with it being out in the middle of nowhere, I could clearly understand what he said. The first guy then started acting quite aggressive and punched a tree, telling me he needed the phone badly, and now his whole life was on the phone, telling me to come and help look for it. While he was punching the tree and ranting, the second guy had taken a few steps away to the right, meaning I couldn't keep eyes on both at the same time. It was after 5pm by this point, and had gotten dark all of a sudden, which made the whole thing even more unsettling. I noticed there was a gap in the fence where some of the bars had been removed right where the second guy was heading, and I decided at that point to get the hell out of there and made a run for it. Neither of them said anything as I ran away, which makes me sure that they had malicious intentions. If they genuinely lost their phone and needed help, I would expect them to shout, where are you going, or something to try and get me to come back, but they didn't shout anything. After sprinting for a good 20 to 30 seconds, I turned to see if they were chasing me. They were both just standing there on the path around where the gap in the fence had been, but they weren't chasing me. They were just standing there, watching me run away. I continued running away, but kept looking back every few seconds until I was out of sight. It was at this point that I got off the canal path and onto the roads. The person I spoke to on the phone to report it took my details and the descriptions, 
but seemed to think it wasn't really anything worth worrying about, but said that it will be investigated. The whole incident has left me a bit unnerved, and I'm sure that I won't be jogging that route alone anytime soon. This happened over a decade ago, but I only recently found this subreddit and I think it's a good fit. It was Halloween of 2008. I was in college and still in a relationship with my first serious boyfriend. We'd been together since high school and it took this night to show me our relationship was abusive. It took one more incident before I finally left him for good. He was wonderful when sober, if intense and controlling, but when he was drunk. I learned he was truly terrifying. This was the first such incident that truly scared me. He joined a stupid game, a Gatorade and Shine challenge. They'd empty a bottle of Gatorade at least halfway, fill the rest up with moonshine. The goal was to finish the bottle within an hour and then tell them crazy stories. Well, he completed the challenge, but he never did tell his friends the story. He couldn't remember most of it and it painted him in a horrific light. I knew things were heading downhill when he started calling me a slut after saying hi to a guy friend of mine at a party we were at. I decided we better head home before he got any worse. I thought I could nip it in the bud, manage it. We get home and change out of our costumes. James wanted to passionately hug, but in his state and after what he'd call me, I wasn't interested. Oddly enough, it led him to calling me a whore. I left the apartment to go smoke. Our neighbors were having a party and two guys were outside smoking as well. They came over to see if I was okay. I'd been crying and they'd heard the yelling. I said I was, which they could obviously see was a lie. They let me know, if I ever needed any help, that they would help me. James chose that moment to come outside, said he'd heard us and told them to get away from me, stalking towards them. I stood up to get between them. They told me they'd meant what they'd said and to not forget it. Then they told him to watch himself. I was facing them to say bye and thanks for the offer when one of the guys gasped, staring at my boyfriend in shock. I turned around and my eyes immediately caught on the ground. Just as what I was seeing registered the other guy lunged forward and grabbed me, pulling me behind him. What was on the ground that had elicited such reactions, you ask? Blood. Blood was dripping on the ground from his hand. He was holding a knife so tight that he'd sliced his own hand open. I begged him to drop it, which he only agreed to when I walked back towards him. I was an idiot, I know. The two guys seemed at a loss, and I feel so bad for them having their Halloween ruined by this scary, crazy bullshit. They left me to it after I swore I'd be fine, reiterating that I could come back to them for any help. We got inside, and I immediately started hiding all sharp objects. I called James's roommates, begging them to come home. He started screaming to give him the knives back. How I was a slut, and if I wouldn't even F him, what use was I? I called my parents and left, then called his mom because I was scared he'd hurt himself. She let me know how he was my problem now. I should have called the police, but didn't want to ruin his life. I know, I know. I'm ashamed to say that I got back together with him for six more months of hell after that. But today, I can safely say that I never want to see James again. It was my turn to take my kids trick-or-treating. The previous year it was my wife's, and we trade back and forth every year. My son and daughter are age seven and nine. Usually I stay on the street while my kids go up the different houses to collect candy. After about half an hour of walking around, we came to one of the more popular hot spots for candy collecting, a main street in the neighborhood. Lots of really cool decorations and animatronics on people's lawns. So I became a bit distracted and stopped watching my kids closely. 
At one point, they came back from a house accompanied by another girl about the same height as my daughter. She was wearing a weird homemade mask, like a cardboard cutout or something. My daughter asked me if she could trick or treat with us, so I said sure and we carried on together as a group. I didn't know who this girl was, but I figured she was just a friend from school. As we continued, I started to notice a large man tailing us. He was wearing some sort of angry cat mask. It was kind of creepy to be honest. I thought that maybe he was the father of the girl, so I tried to start up some small chat with him. I said something like, nice weather, eh? But he didn't respond. He just stood there staring at me while our kids went up the stairs to the next house. I tried again, asking, hey, is that your daughter? He nodded but didn't say anything. I figured he just wasn't in the mood for chatting, so I stopped trying. We carried on for about another 15 minutes, until suddenly my kids came up to me and said they wanted to go home. This surprised me as we hadn't been out for too long, and their bags were only about a third full. In any case, I agreed, waved goodbye to the man in the cat mask and his daughter, and started on our way home. The weird thing is that when I glanced back at the man and his daughter, they were just standing there, staring at us. I checked one more time as we turned the corner and they were still standing there, not having moved at all. At this point, I decided to ask my kids, so who was that girl? My daughter looked back up at me with a confused look on her face. She's your friend, my daughter replied. I asked her what she meant. Apparently, the girl with the cardboard mask approached them and said she was a friend of mine. She told my daughter she was too shy to ask me if she could join us to trick or treat and one of my daughter asked me instead. I laughed at this story and replied to my daughter, why would you think she was my friend? I don't have any children friends. What my daughter said next chilled my bones. According to her, when the girl with the cardboard mask approached them for the first time, she wasn't wearing the mask, so they were able to see her face. As it turns out, she wasn't a girl at all, but an older woman around my age with wrinkles on her face. What's even more disturbing, the old woman had started to steal treats from my daughter's bag, apparently when I wasn't looking. This is why they asked me to go home. The old woman was creeping them out and they wanted to just get away from her. I brought my kids home and told my wife what happened. We made sure to check through all their candy, but didn't find anything suspicious or off. We didn't call the police or anything, since nothing really happened. But thinking back, I kind of regret that decision now. What the heck was that old woman doing? And who the hell was that man following us around? I don't think I'll ever know. I just think it's sick that there are people out there on Halloween hiding behind masks, pretending to be children. Last night had to be one of the most frightening minutes of my life. It's 10.30 p.m. The baby is down for bedtime. I'm in the bedroom trying to fall asleep. Next thing I know, the doorbell rings. It's 10.30 at night. Who the hell is ringing my doorbell? It's going to wake up the baby and I'm near angry and a little shaken. I peek through the peephole and see two men that look like they're in their early to mid 20s. At that point, I just get scared. What are two strangers doing ringing and knocking at 10.30 at night, especially on Halloween night? I froze for a minute and just watched. They kept ringing and knocking. I retreated to the bedroom to grab my phone. I called my fiance. Because I'm not smart, I know I should have called the police first. But he doesn't answer, and he's asleep and six hours away for an FTX. They just keep ringing and knocking for almost five minutes. They aren't giving up. Some sense kicks in and I call the police non-emergency line. I didn't call 911 because I wasn't sure if it qualified as an emergency. I didn't know what they wanted. Right as the dispatcher takes my name and address, they leave. I tell the dispatcher to cancel the report, and he tells me that if they come back, just call 911. I've never been so scared in my life. I'm home alone with the baby while the fiance is away. I've never felt so threatened in my own home. My fiance is hoping that they were either trying to prank someone or that they were drunk trying to get into the wrong apartment. My instincts tells me that they weren't friendly and my instinct is usually right. 
I was nearly defenseless in my home. I'm not about to open the door to two strange people. I'm still shaking today. I don't want to leave the apartment. I really hope they don't come back again. I'd rather not have to threaten that I have a weapon, now that I know where it is, and will use it if absolutely necessary as a last line of defense. I'd rather not encounter them again. I just hope they stay away. Two years ago, my boyfriend, our best guy friend, and myself all attended a Halloween party for a college that we did not go to. We knew very few people at this party, and at the time of this event, they had all either left or passed out drunk. As most college parties do, people tend to get way too trashed way too early in the night. College kids do not live up to their partying reputation, because as this story progresses, Understand that everyone in this story is probably way too inhibited for their own good, aside from my boyfriend, friend, and I, who drink fairly often. The odd dynamic that probably escalated this situation is that my boyfriend and I don't really express PDA, and when I show up with other male friends of mine, people don't necessarily think that I have a date at the party. However, I tend to be pretty standoffish to people that I don't know, and take pride in my disengaging attitude that I feel prevents creepy encounters. I'm not an easy target. This story is about Muhammad, the host of this party. We arrive and find him outside sitting and talking with a girl. As we approach, she leaves him there. Muhammad tells us that he was just rejected by her. We pick him back up and give him the plenty of fish in the sea shtick and try not to let it dampen the party. Muhammad takes this as an invitation. Since that moment, he is taking every chance he can to put his arm across my shoulders, getting offended when I brush him off, and following us from room to room. Muhammad is absolutely trashed before we even start drinking, so we are hyper-focused on his attempts. We're just still trying to party, so every time he followed us, we would delicately leave the room, only for him to tag along not a few seconds later. Our suspicions were confirmed when we're gathering information on our beloved host, we find the girl who had rejected him earlier. She tells us that she had never met him before, and before we had showed up, he had tried to kiss her, and she was relieved when we interrupted. Our party goers, when questioned about this behavior, simply said, Oh, that's just Muhammad when he drinks. My boyfriend and I started kissing sloppily as a defense mechanism so that Muhammad knows that I am a lady who has spoken for, and I have a boyfriend watch my back every time I go to the bathroom so I would not be cornered. Muhammad is continuing to drink heavily. My best friend leaves with his DD and leaves my boyfriend and I there. My boyfriend and I are still having a good time, but making plans to leave. We intend to drink the place dry before we go just to spite our rude hosts. We're assholes, we know. So he and I plan ourselves on the couch together with a bottle of Jameo. Hugh Muhammad stage left. He has a full cup of beer and can hardly make words or stand upright. He points to my bottle. I hesitate giving it to him for obvious reasons. He gestures again and I feign ignorance. Muhammad grabs this bottle of whiskey and dumps its remains into his beer hastily. He goes to take a satisfied slurp and spills half the contents into my lap. Party foul. When he realizes all the attention is on him, he stumbles away. We decide that this is the time to leave. In the calm of the storm, my boyfriend and I are in the basement alone, laughing and draining the keg set up there before we make our escape. Lo and behold, Muhammad stumbles down, barely coherent but looking for trouble. My boyfriend suggests we make our way past him up the stairs and leave, like we had been doing all night. Muhammad has other ideas. I step one foot on the stairs and this drunk asshat puts his arm and shoulder across the front of my body to prevent me from leaving. Big no-no. My boyfriend and I have been the most easygoing, non-confrontational people all night, and we have had enough. Dude, it's time to stop, is all my boyfriend said before Muhammad lunged at him, and they begin brawling. Muhammad, being the more physically inhibited one, is not landing any blows, but is too drunk to feel pain. 
so it takes a bit of struggling for my boyfriend and I to restrain him on the ground. I yell that he better fucking stay there until we leave, and we proceed upstairs to inform his friends where he is. On the first floor of the house, trying to collect ourselves, Muhammad emerges from the basement, and he is pissed. He is completely incoherent, and no one can talk any sense into him. The scariest part about this was his eyes, completely bloodshot and void of any awareness, almost animal-like. He goes after my boyfriend and catches me in between them, so my boyfriend and I are trying desperately to fend him off together while all the sleepy drunks are waking up from the screaming from yours truly. I don't know how screaming would help, but I guess that's what I felt like doing. He finally subsides and my boyfriend and I fly out the door into the street, leaving the door wide open behind us. The weirdest part being that, as we left, the other party goers were yelling, Dude, dude, what are you doing? Muhammad says, I love her. The partiers remind him, You don't know her. And with that, we left. And I haven't seen Muhammad since. This is my first time posting on Reddit. I had a strange, unsolved experience as a kid that has been on my mind a lot lately, and I decided that this is the place to share. The first half of the story takes place on Halloween in 1991. Quick bit of background. I was a seven-year-old boy at the time, and my little sister was only a few months old. I lived in Long Island, New York, on the border area of the town that kind of acted as an unspoken separation between the more affluent area and the lower income hood type area. My dad owned a bar across the train station that was extremely popular in the 80s and was still riding the tail end of that boom. My father did very well for himself. My father and his business were well known around town. I think this might have to do with what happened. He eventually squandered everything on a heroin addiction, but that's a different story. And for the record, I had nothing but love and respect for him despite this. So it was Halloween. My mom was working the night shift at my dad's bar. My sister was home with a teenage babysitter. My dad had taken me and my friend trick-or-treating. This was the first year that I was able to go out at night, so I was super stoked. When we get home, there are cops at my house. The babysitter is crying, and my mom came home. Earlier, while the sitter was alone with my sister, she got a phone call from an unknown woman asking to speak to little OP. She said it was not there, and the woman stated that she had a gift for me and would call back. This woman called back a few times saying something similar, and she began to insist that she was going to come deliver her gift. Eventually, she called and said to look in the mailbox. This is when the babysitter called the police. The police found a pirate skull Halloween decoration that would talk and shake when you clapped, as well as several candy bars. My whole family was really bugged out about this. I was scared, but I also kind of liked the skull thing and convinced my parents after much protest to let me keep it. My parents for a few weeks after that were on edge and hated the toy. They tried to work with the police, but there wasn't much they could do, and the whole thing kind of went cold. Fast forward to the following summer, 1992. My best friend and I decided to have a car wash in front of his house, which was diagonally across the street from my house. We had buckets, soap, a hose and a sign. You get the picture. This black car rolls up. It was an old 80s Crown Vic or something that looked like that. One of those big cars that steers like a boat. Rolls down the window and there's a woman sitting in the driver's seat. She has short white hair. Kind of the whole Ursula vibe going. I told my parents she was old because of the hair. But looking back, she could have been as young as her 40s. She says... Hi, OP. Do you know who I am? I said no. She goes, I'm the one who gave you those nice presents on Halloween. My jaw drops, and I freeze, just staring at her. Then, like something out of a movie, she begins to laugh maniacally and then speeds off. I ran home and told my parents. That was the end of it, and they never figured out who it was. 
My father had speculated that this person may have believed he was wealthy and maybe was trying to get a ransom. Maybe she was a scorned ex-lover. I don't know. I've speculated many things, but will likely never know at this point, as I am now 35 and that was a lifetime ago. Sorry if the story had an underwhelming payoff at the end, but it has bugged me for years and I wanted to share it. In the past year, I've had several of my dad's old friends find and reach out to me on Facebook. My dad and I have the same name and face, so I was easy to find. Two of them are women. One of them made me a little uncomfortable because she kept pushing to hang out and she's a lot older than me. Like go to the bar hangout. I said no, of course, but she asked me a lot of personal questions. That's what brought the story back to the forefront of my mind. I'm getting a weird feeling in my gut that this woman, or even the other one that found me on Facebook, is the same woman that stalked me as a child. That thought gives me a chill, but I would really like to know who this person was and why they stalked me. So this only happened yesterday, and it's been driving me crazy. It's not as wild as other stories on here, but it's by far one of the creepiest things that's ever happened to me. So my husband and I are walking home from having a beer at the local pub around 6 p.m. In terms of setting the scene, we live in a small New Zealand town. The population is around 2,000. It's a real mixed bag in terms of residents. Older folk, meth heads, low income, but... Increasingly, commuters from our capital city have been settling here. We fall into the latter category. It's spring here, so it's still plenty light, and we're just chatting as we walk the 10 minutes or so home. About three minutes into the walk, at the first intersection on our walk, I spot a cat sitting on the fence of one of the corner houses on the other side of the street from us. I say meow, and it meows back. It then starts stalking a bird, so my husband and I continue watching this house. The cat, really, as we walk past. Suddenly, a person with a brown paper bag mask on their head kind of stumbles out of the front door of his house, into the yard. Their mannerisms and how they're moving are so strange, but not what I'd associate with being drunk. The house itself seems completely dead, so there's no party or anything. The person then turns to us and makes eye contact. Well, the eye holes in the mask are staring at us. Then, he starts backing away slowly to the front door alcove of the house and disappears from view into the alcove. We've been slowly walking this whole time, and at this point, I have literal goosebumps and an intense sense of dread. When I write it down, it sounds so silly, but there was something so creepy about this person. We're still looking as we walk past the house, and the paper bag face slowly emerges from the alcove, watching us before disappearing from view again. As we walk and get further and further away, we keep turning around to look, and the same thing happens over and over again. Nothing. And then slowly but surely, the paper bag face emerges out to watch us. This continued until we were at the end of the street, some 350 meters and rounded the corner out of sight. It still makes my skin crawl thinking about it. My husband laughed and said it was probably some kid getting ready for Halloween or just messing with us. And he's probably right. But I had to keep turning around to watch my back the rest of the walk home because I was so creeped out. Hi everyone, I'm really writing this out as a way to vent because I'm in a situation where I feel really stuck. Any advice is appreciated, but I'm not sure there's anything that can be said that will actually help. I've tried just about everything. I'm going to start from the beginning. This story is two years in the making, so I'll try to be as thorough as possible. In 2019, I graduated with my master's degree and moved to a relatively rural area for my PhD. Thinking we'd make an investment, my dad and I purchased a house. 
The intent was to rent it out once I completed my PhD. This house was only a block away from a dive bar where my dad was able to make some pretty good friends. He introduced me to everyone, and everyone let me know that I would be so happy in my new house, because my next door neighbor was the absolute nicest guy you could ever meet. So, we met the neighbor, and he did seem nice enough. He suggested we exchange numbers just in case I ever needed anything, and I thought that was a good idea. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? A few days later, my dad left to go back to his home in another state, and I was left to my own devices. Literally, the day he left it started. My neighbor texted me while I was away, and let me know he left a gift for me on my front porch. In this text exchange, he started using pet names like Sweetie and Cutie. I went home, and he had left a hand-painted feeding dish for my cats in my mailbox. At this point, I wasn't that alarmed. He was just being nice, I thought. The next day, he sent me more texts with pet names, and I took the opportunity to make sure that he knew that I was not interested in anything romantic. He replied back with a rambling text about how all a person ever needs is friends, and he would like to be friends with me. After that, he would send me texts frequently. Everything from inviting me fishing to telling me that he left more gifts on my porch. I would often not reply, or I would tell him I'm busy. I didn't want to be rude, but I also had no interest in any sort of relationship with him other than neighborly. One night, I got a text from the manager of the bar down the street, letting me know that if my neighbor knocked on my door, I shouldn't answer. She then told me that my neighbor had walked down to the bar with a hatchet and told the bartender he was hearing voices that got louder as he got closer to the bar. He threatened to kill someone with the hatchet if the voices didn't stop. They called the police and the police took the hatchet from him, but made no arrest. The manager of the bar picked me up and I spent the night at her house. She told me that the police said my neighbor was on meth. After that, I tried to keep my distance even more, but things got even weirder. One day, I went out to my car to find a dead squirrel in my driveway. This squirrel had very clearly been run over and it was moved to right in front of my driver's side door. I stepped over it, got in my car and left. When I returned home, the squirrel was gone. Shortly after, I received a text from my neighbor that said, Someone or something put a dead squirrel in your driveway. Don't worry, I moved it for you. I felt like this was a weird way to word this, and I suspect that he's the one who put the squirrel in my driveway to begin with. Another time, I walked out of my house to see he had placed an unspent shotgun shell on the bricks in his front yard. He came out and told me it was to serve as a warning for anyone walking between our houses. For the next couple of months, I did my best to avoid him. He would text me inviting me over, and I would come up with an excuse or just ignore him completely. I wanted to remain cordial since he was my neighbor, but it was getting very annoying and I was uncomfortable. He would text me as soon as I got home, telling me that he was watching me come and go from my house. Around Halloween, he handcrafted a large casket and wrote, Here lies the last son of a bitch who played mind games. November 2012. What? All this time, still sending me texts. Eventually, I got fed up and stopped responding completely. Less than two weeks after I stopped responding completely, he threw a 50-pound flower pot at my front door. You know those big concrete planters? Yeah, one of those. I called the police who advised me to get a stalking no-contact order. A few days later, I was watching TV when a notification popped up that my neighbor was trying to cast a video to my screen. I declined it twice. I filed another report with the police. During this time, I started the process of getting a stalking no-contact order. I saw three different victims advocates who all told me different things. I went out of town for a conference. And during that time, someone had attempted to break into my home. I had an ADT security system, so while they didn't succeed, I was aware of the attempt. After the conference, I came home to the entire world shutting down because of COVID. I was trapped in my home 24-7, with my stalker neighbor right next door. Luckily, court proceedings for protection orders didn't stop. Right after court, he sent me a text telling me that he was sorry for what he'd done that he could tell when he saw me outside that he made me uncomfortable. Then he went on to tell me he can tell my hair has gotten longer, and I look beautiful. I went to court and provided all the evidence I had, the timeline of everything that had ever happened, the text he'd sent me asking if I wanted a massage, 
The text I sent him telling him the, the way that he was speaking to me was inappropriate. The text saying that he knew he made me uncomfortable. I told the judge that I had suspected he had attempted to break into my house while I was out of town. The kicker is, he didn't deny any of it. Actually, he told the judge that he took full accountability for everything. He said he was in recovery and was trying to turn over a new leaf. He didn't oppose the protection order at all. So, in March of 2020, I actually received the stalking no contact order. Everything was pretty quiet for a while. I mean, he did some weird stuff, but that's because he's a weird guy. It wasn't anything that made me fear for my safety. That is, until he got on drugs again. At this time, we found an unspent shotgun casing in my flower bed. It was consistent with the one that he had previously used to send a warning. This occurred a couple of months after I started dating my boyfriend, and I suspected that it was a warning to him. After this, and for a variety of reasons, my boyfriend moved in with me. He moved in pretty quickly, but everything turned out fine. We're still together and as happy in our relationship as we can be. New Year's 2021. I was awoken to yelling. I turned on my security cameras and got footage of him sticking his head out his window and screaming obscenities at my bedroom window for about seven minutes. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when your stalker is screaming threats and obscenities, seven minutes is forever. He called me a harlot. He said, happy effing new year. He said he was going to blow up his house with a gas line. I called the police who responded. They told me that he never said my name so they can't prove it was a violation of the protection order. The officer said, and I quote, there's nothing illegal about yelling in your own house. They left without even speaking to him. All I could do at this point was do my best to avoid him. I parked on my street because my driveway is pretty close to his front porch. I got used to living with curtains drawn. I always made sure my cameras were charged. All five of them. Yes. Because of him, I spent over a thousand dollars on cameras. Every inch of my yard is covered. Since then, he's been seen by me and by my other neighbors, talking to people who aren't there. Going outside and screaming nonsense. Things like, I have Cheerios on my necklace. Or, I'll put my arm up your anus. I'm not even joking. This basically brings me to last week. In the morning, I was getting ready for the day when I heard screaming, someone is going to die over this sweatshirt. I turned on the cameras. I got footage of him walking around the alley behind my house screaming, are you fucking proud? How about I get my shotgun? I'll get everybody all fired up. I called the police. Once again, they didn't charge him with the violation of the protection order. Instead, they gave him an ordinance violation for disturbing the peace. The police told me that it seems like he's off his medication again. And that was that. They left. Last night, I was awoken to hammering outside my window at 1 a.m. He was cutting down his privacy fence, horizontally. I called the police for a noise complaint, and they just told him to stop. And that was that. As I write this, he is outside continuing to horizontally cut down his privacy fence. That means the privacy fence only stands about three feet tall now. This was the one thing that made me feel relatively safe about hanging out in my own backyard. And now that's gone. All of this to say, I'm fucking tired. I just want to live in a house where I can be sure that my neighbor won't try to kill me. Where I can feel confident that he's not going to try to break in. My boyfriend and I are trying to buy a house to move, but it's difficult. I'm a PhD student so I don't make very much money. Renting won't work because I have four cats, plus my partner's cat and dog, although we have a place secured for them if necessary. And finding a place to rent with so many animals is difficult, if not impossible. I refuse to rehome them, so maybe it's partially my fault that I'm stuck in this situation. My dad has agreed to co-sign on another mortgage, and I've gotten a second job. We should be able to save up enough money within a few months, but until then, I'm stuck. I just don't know what else to do. I'm tired. I'm angry. So I figured I'd write this to vent. If you've made it this far, thanks for reading it all. There's still so many different instances that I left out. I'm just so exhausted.
so this was two years ago on Halloween. I just discovered this subreddit about an hour ago and decided to post my own encounter. My best friend and I were leaving a club in Dallas, and we stopped at a gas station to pick up some snacks and refreshments. This guy comes up to me and tells me that I look pretty. At this point, I'm drunk and not worried about a damn thing, so I thank him, smile, and continue looking for munchies. He starts to follow me through the gas station, but I just kind of shrug it off. Me and my friend pay, and we're walking out when he comes up behind us and asks where we're going. At this point, I'm thinking, F off, dude. We say curtly that we're going home, and he seemed to take the hint and left. We started to walk down the street. My friend was planning on driving us home in my car since I was unfit to drive. My friend wasn't 21 yet, so he hadn't been drinking. We were about three blocks from my car when we noticed a car driving really slowly behind us. We glance back a few times and realize that it's the guy from the gas station following us. We decide that it's not a good idea to lead him back to my car. So we turn around and walk a different way back towards the street where the clubs are. He makes an illegal U-turn and follows us. He then rolls down his window and shouts to us asking if we need a ride. Politely, I say no thank you. We're all good and we just made a wrong turn. He continues to follow us. We speed up our pace a little bit and he speeds up as well. He calls out to us again through the passenger window, asking again if we want a ride. I tell him to please stop following us or I'll have to call the police. He then calls me a cunt and speeds off. And yeah, all of this happened on Halloween. So it's pretty weird. This story took place in 2008. My family was invited by one of my brother's friends to go trick-or-treating in our neighborhood. At the time, I was 13 years old. I am a male and have a very tall build. The night went as normal for the most part until I got to this one house. After leaving the house, I was suddenly tackled to the ground by a kid of about my age who put a knife to my neck. My first reaction was to kick him off of me. Back then, I was known for my ability to send people flying a few feet when pinned down. He flew off. Next thing I knew, I see more kids of his age around me, all of them with pocket knives as well. I knew I could take on one kid, but the six or seven, I was no match for. I bolted as fast as I could, and the group gave chase. I probably ran for 10 to 15 minutes before I found a place to hide. I jumped, and about 20 seconds later, I saw the group run right past me. That was my cue to return to my brother's friend's house. Nothing too serious happened after that. Though, as we were leaving the area that night, my mom pointed out a few cop cars with some kids getting inside. One of them looked like the kid who tackled me. When I saw my brother's friends next, he mentioned that no one was hurt by them and they were just playing a prank. But it was enough for someone's parents to call the police. This happened on Halloween night in 2001. I was seven. If you want to know my current age, do the math. My mom helped me remember this one. So if there are further questions, I will ask her as she remembers the night vividly. It was freezing, probably within the 20 to 30 degree range. I was hell bent on going out anyways. I wanted my pillowcase to be stocked full of sweets, damn it. I dressed as a cat. Not too hard to imagine that. Now at the time, I had zero idea, but my rock star mom was on it, and you can thank her for her on-par memory. My mom noticed a very tall man dressed in all black. My mom said that he had black jeans on, a black trench coat, and a black hockey mask. He had no kids with him, so that was a huge red flag to my mom, but he did have a pumpkin basket to put candy in. He followed us around house to house always stayed back three or four houses according to mom. After 20 minutes or so, she shrugged it off, thinking this was just some really tall kid just innocently out trick-or-treating. But the more she said she kept shrugging it off, the more uneasy she felt. 
Now, I do remember my pillowcase was only half full, and my mom hurrying us home and me being sour pouty about it. I do not, however, remember mom putting the house on lockdown after we got in the front door. But she remembers, and said she did it very quickly. I ate some candy, brushed my teeth, and got into bed. My mom laid down next to me. I remember this and thought it was a little weird since I was sleeping on my own at the age of seven. Now this is where my mom really helped me out with this story, because I had no idea until we talked about it earlier. Fast forward to the morning. There was a pumpkin basket, full of candy, with a note on top that said meow in chicken scratch, on our front porch right outside the front door. My mom threw out the candy in case it was tampered with, and she burned up the note. Now what creeps me out, and I just found out from my mom earlier, is that in the middle of the night, she got up from my bed to recheck the house, looked out the window, and saw him in our front lawn staring at the house with the pumpkin basket in his hand. She didn't think that he noticed her. She called the police immediately. She briefed the officer on what happened. The officer said she'd do a few rounds and patrol the area. My mom never heard back from the officer that night. Or ever, she said. My mom also told me she stayed up the entire night with a pistol in her lap after seeing him in the front yard. Since that night, and up until right now, nothing weird with him has happened since. But as for his intentions, I have no idea. And I don't think that I want to know. So to preface this, I live in Los Angeles, in an area right on the cusp of being dangerous in my opinion. I had just gotten off of work on Halloween at about 3 a.m., and me and my brother decided to go to 7-Eleven for some snacks and candy so we could somewhat celebrate a Halloween spent working. We get there, and there's a visibly drunk guy idling by the door who turns to us and smiles, and then opens the doors for us and insists that we go in. We just say thanks and walk in. The cashier, who knows me and my brother by name, and I've never seen yell, is instantly eyeing this guy as he goes to the cold drink aisle. I don't know what he was doing as we were looking at the candy, but the cashier starts yelling at him, telling him to get out. The guy doesn't go. The cashier calls the cops. This is where the guy starts roaming around the store, and eventually stops next to me, and starts asking me how my night's going, with both of his hands in his pockets. I tell him fine, and he starts getting closer to me, and stands at an angle where he's almost out of my peripheral vision, behind me, and every time I pivot to keep him in view, he moves again. Then I fully turn to him, and he says to me, You know mein Kampf, my dude? And I say, Yeah, I know what it is. This, I assume, he interprets while drunk as I've read it. Then he asks me, You German, man? You for Hitler? And I say, Nah, man. Then he says, you want to die tonight, man? I'm ready to die tonight. Man, it's been a good night. Which he says while getting real close to me. Then I tell him to back off, and he gets real offended saying that he's just having a conversation. I quickly walked away from him and left when my brother was done buying his food. Luckily, the cops arrived right as we left, and the guy could see us walk in the direction of our home, which was only a block away. Hello everybody, long time lurker, first time poster. I apologize in advance for any spelling errors, I'm using my tablet. This happened when I was around the age of 12 on Halloween night. My friend and I were off to go egging. The two of us hit a few houses, got the evil bitch neighbor of mine. Lucky for us, she left her patio door open, eggs straight into the kitchen. As the night continued on, more and more trick-or-treaters were disappearing from the streets. It was getting late and pretty dark. At this point, I'm ready to go home. My friend insists that we go meet up with a buddy of his to continue on with the Halloween festivities. I agree to go with him. 
I had a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach, but stupidly, I agreed. We begin our roughly two-block hike to his friend's house. The streetlights are on, but they're pretty far apart, and some are pretty dim. So there are some pretty dark patches of street. Dark enough to where anyone could be hiding, and you wouldn't have the slightest clue of it. As we're walking through one of these dark patches, there just so happens to be an alley on our left side, which was equally as dark, and the street to our right. By this time, no one is on the streets but us and a few straggler trick-or-treaters calling it in for the night. We make it about halfway to his friend's house when I hear the screech of an old, beat-up pickup truck's brake engage on the street to the right of us. We both freeze. My stomach dropped along with my eyes being stuck open in disbelief. Two men wearing black ski masks and dark clothing. I honestly can't remember anything about the ski masks step out of the old, rusted, beat-to-hell Ford truck and walk towards us with a purpose. The driver, with a big smile on his face, looked me dead in the eye and says, What's up, fellas? His voice was scratchy and sounded to be in the mid-thirties. I can't think of anything else to compare it to. As I continue to stand there in shock, my friend grabs my arm and we book it. We make a left onto the street and start pounding on a few doors. No one answers. By now, we are both frantically trying to find a way to ditch these guys. We only make it a few houses down the block before they come roaring down the street in their truck. We end up spotting a house across the street with their porch light on, which is the intergalactic rule of Halloween for, yes, we have candy still, meaning hopefully someone was still awake in that house and willing to answer the door. We both start running down the street, all while the masked men are still speeding towards us. As soon as we step onto the other side of the street, they blew by us. They were actually going to try and hit us. We make it up to the house and pound and kick on the door until the woman answers. We explain what had just happened. She grabs the phone for us and my friend calls his dad to come get us. While he's on the phone, I'm looking up and down the street. No creeps. No trucks. Not a single person. While I'm still scanning, the woman who potentially just saved our lives tells me her husband is a cop and she called him and let him know. At the time, that was the best news I had heard in my young life. A few minutes go by and my friend's dad comes and gets us. He drops me off at home and tells my parents what happened. My parents call the police. They come to my house and ask me questions. Unfortunately, me being young and still terrified, I wasn't much help. After that night, I never heard from the police about them being caught and never saw that truck again. Looking back, From the point of the men approaching us up until we ran into the woman's house, only about three minutes went by, but it felt like hours. This story may not be as scary as some of the others here, but at the time, I was scared out of my mind. The events happened in October of 2003, obviously since it's Halloween. I was 10 years old and in sixth grade. Where I am from, the middle schools got out after the elementary schools and high schools. My friends and I knew that we would have to immediately start trick-or-treating if we wanted to get any candy. Remember, Halloween of 2003 was on a Friday. This excited us. We could hit every house we wanted and didn't have to worry about school the next day. After school, our parents picked us up and drove us to our friend Alex's house. He lived on a road named South Herald. To the left of South Herald was an identical street named South Concord. At the end of one side of South Herald was a turn that brought you to South Concord. On the other side was a main road. Alec lived closer to the main road, so our plan was to start at his house, go to the main road, then turn up and go down Concord. After that, we'd go back down to Harold and return to Alec's house. Let's begin, shall we? Okay, so we began trick-or-treating. There was probably about 12 of us, but the notable ones were myself, Alec, Nate, and James. We had been accruing a great deal of candy when we got to this fateful house. It wasn't unlike any of the other houses, two stories, a garage, front lawn, etc. However, 
there was a Michael Myers statue, or so I thought, in the front lawn. We went up to the house, got candy, and then examined the statue. It was holding a knife and was hunched over. James decided it was a good idea to kick it in the shin. Suddenly, the statue jumped and began holding its shin. We were frightened that this statue was actually a dude. I'm gonna effing kill you, said the man. Obviously, plenty of people claim to want to kill someone and not really mean it. We just assumed that it was an idle threat and continued on our way. At like 8.30, it got pretty dark out. I lived up north at the time, and anyone who lives up there can agree that it gets dark pretty quickly. Anyway, we were still collecting candy when Nate and I began discussing the science behind slasher films. Like, who gets off first and whatnot. One of the people we were with, who was in the middle of the pack, dropped his bag. We all stopped and waited. Now, the person had to turn around in order to pick up his bag. When he lifted up his head, he began to squint as if he was trying hard to see something. We all turned to see the man in the Michael Myers costume walking behind us. It was odd. No one else was with him. Hell, we were the only group on the road. He was still holding onto the knife. When he noticed we were looking at him, he quickened his pace. Being stupid preteens, we booked it. Looking over my shoulder, I realized that he started running too. Fortunately for my slow ass, he was a decent length behind us. Our luck even turned more in our favor when a minivan stopped at the end of Concord. It was one of the people I was with's mother. We all piled in and quickly told her that someone was chasing us. She drove us back to Alec's house. What makes this even worse is that Alec and Nate told me that the man was still roaming the streets after we had all left. I don't think I really have felt so terrified. I honestly have never left the house on Halloween since. Now, whether or not the knife was real or not is irrelevant. It's one of those things that I had no intention of knowing, just in case it was real. Again, this story pales in comparison to some of the other experiences here, and I'm not really much of a storyteller. But still, I hope you enjoyed my misfortune. I have other stories under my belt, but here's a memory from when I was younger. My dad was the coolest guy on the block, probably because he was one of the three black dads who lived in our town. The population is around 98% Caucasian, and that's not an exaggeration. He was a state police officer, intimidating, wore Oakleys before the hipsters, and he was generally a rough sounding person. Damn do I miss him. But the one thing he feared the most was Halloween. He would tell my sister and I stories at night about his life when he was in high school, in the slums of New Jersey, and that every Halloween crazy things would happen. He may have been pulling our legs a bit, but we didn't care. When Halloween would roll around, he would take us out while mom stayed home to trick or treat. One night, in fifth grade, Lexi and I were dressed as a witch and a 50s poodle skirt girl. Dad held our hands walking to the last street when I realized I'd lost mom's scarf she'd let me borrow. She loved that thing, so we walked all the way back towards the darker end of the street. It's by the woods and a small stream, but when it's dark, you can't see anything. Dad said he's seen something and walked towards it. When he got there, he started slowing down. He was staring at something in the dark that we couldn't see. Lexi called out to him if he found mom's scarf. He told her to be quiet and started crouching down, looking in the distance. For several moments, we stood there waiting. I could make out the scarf above his head tied to a branch. He grabbed the scarf tied, still staring in the dark, and started backing away. Then, Dad screamed and sort of shuffled backwards. It was a low, throaty scream like he was furious. He was swearing too, but I don't remember what he was saying. Whatever Dad had been staring at, then bolted out of the trees and ran down the street, opposite of where we lived. It was a little child, probably boy from his silhouette shape, in a black costume with skeleton bones in the front and a skull mask. When Lexi and I tried to go over and see what happened, Dad yelled for us to stay back. 
He got onto his ancient cell phone and called mom to come pick us up. His next call was to the local police. We left before we could see anything. But the next day, mom told us about the dead skinned animals that they had found. By the time us kids could go look, they taped off the place and taken out the bloody animals. But there were stains on the pavement and the smell was pretty bad. The kids talked about it in school a little and I was curious if they ever caught the boy. Nothing came out in the local papers though and it was quickly forgotten. Eventually, dad could have told me more, but it was the last Halloween we'd ever spend together. But I do remember him and mom arguing for the next couple of days about ever letting us go back to trick-or-treating ever again. With the recent Mortal Kombat 10 DLC, including Jason Voorhees, it got me thinking recently about this one encounter I had with someone on Halloween when I was 14 years old. I was around that time in my life where most kids my age would stop trick-or-treating, either because they thought it was lame or because their parents told them to stop. Me and my father had a similar conversation, and in the end, we decided that this trick-or-treat would be my final one. So when October 31st came, my dad helped me paint my face to look like a zombie. I figured that this costume should be simple, yet something I liked, so zombie it was. I grabbed an empty pillowcase and headed out, with my parents telling me to be back by 11-ish. Before you ask, yes, I was going trick-or-treating by myself. I was able to convince my parents that I needed to get as much candy as I could, seeing as how I wouldn't be able to do this again next year. So off I went, running from house to house, shoving candy into my pillowcase as fast as I could. So by the time it got dark, my pillowcase is about three quarters filled, and I had no intent on slowing down. As I'm about to walk into a new neighborhood, a black van pulls up to the curb that was about a few feet away from me. The door opens, and out of the darkness comes some guy in a hockey mask and tattered jacket, wielding a machete. He turns his head towards me, probably just trying to creep me out. Nice Jason costume, I say, trying to be friendly as I begin to walk past him. Thanks, zombie. You want some candy? I've got bags of them. He says as he pulls out these little sacks of candy. So I, being the idiot 14-year-old I was, open my pillowcase and let him plop two or three sacks into it. Make sure you eat them real soon. You'll love them. He snickered, which really sent a chill down my spine. He left as quickly as he came but I just shrugged it off as I needed to finish trick-or-treating. I continued down the road again, going from house to house for candy. After about the third or fourth house, I noticed something odd. It was the same black van from before. After every house I went to, the van would get closer and closer. At around what I could only guess was 10.30, I headed home with my sack full to bursting. As I walked, the area behind me illuminated, I turned around, expecting to see a car that would soon pass me. It was the van, and in the driver's seat was the same Jason Voorhees who gave me the quote-unquote candy. My heart stopped, and I broke into a mad dash back to my house, the van easily keeping up with me. I was luckily able to lose him by running into the woods near my house. I exited the woods that led to the side of my house, and looked for the fake rock that held the spare key to our home. After I got in, I put my candy on the kitchen table and somehow found a way to go to sleep. The next morning when I woke up, my parents were sitting at the kitchen table, digging around through the bags of candy that Jason gave me. They started asking me where slash who I got the bags from, which started to freak me out. I would later learn that the bags of candy were nothing more than just bags of prescription drugs. There was a ton of sleeping pills in them, and I finally understood his intentions. He was going to follow me until I fell asleep, then do God knows what with me after he got me in the van. Now that I think about it, I'm not sure whether or not that machete he had was fake or not. The police came up empty-handed, so I guess I'll never know his fate.
So to start, I'm a female, and at the time of this story, I was 13 years old, going out with a few friends for Halloween. It was a tradition that stopped after that night, but we would all get together and go out and have a good time, then head to one of our houses to watch horror movies until the sunrise the next morning. For some stupid reason, the six of us decided to split up, so Sarah and Alex went one way towards Sarah's house because she was tired. Alice and Jessica went to head towards some more of the houses to stop at before meeting up with us again, and Rachel and I went off in the opposite direction towards the school. Rachel told me that she wasn't feeling too well, and that she wanted to head back to Alice's place, so she went back towards Alice's house leaving me alone. It was around 10 at night and I was getting cold, so I thought that it would be a good idea to cut through the park to go to Alice's house myself. We had decided beforehand to meet back at her house once we were all done. As I was getting close to the park, I could hear some boys laughing about something. I thought it was nothing and just ignored them. When I got to the walkway, I saw about four boys standing in the park. One clearly had something in his hand. I couldn't tell what it was and I started walking faster to pass them. They all started walking to the path and blocked me. For reference, I went as Amy Lee. So I had a short, poofy, strapless dress on and high heels. There was no way that I was going to outrun them. They started saying stuff like, Hey sexy, where are you off to? Why didn't you come say hi to us? What's a girl like you doing out here so late? I gave short answers and tried backing away. I don't really remember how I got away, but I'm pretty sure it's because I sacked one of them. I just remember running like hell in my shitty heels back to Alice's place. When I got there, all the other girls were crying. Alex had already gone home, but Alice and Jessica and Rachel were on Alice's front lawn and asked me if I saw those guys in the park. Alice and Jessica had dressed as boys for that year, and apparently those guys tried to fight them. And when they figured out that they were girls, they were grabbing at them and making comments. They got away because Alice held her phone up to them and said that she was calling the police. We decided that we weren't going to go out for Halloween after that. And eventually, we all stopped talking. But before that, we never talked about that night to anyone else. This happened back in elementary school. I was around seven or eight years old at the time. I haven't thought about it too much in the past years, but reading through this sub made me think about this. However, at school there was the annual Halloween party, where brothers and sisters of my elementary schoolmates were invited. We always had lots of fun, would eat spooky snacks, etc. I was wearing a vampire costume, and my best friend Sarah at the time had a strange costume that involved some fake plastic chains, but seemed real because they were quite heavy. The story begins. Sarah tells me she had to go to the bathroom, so we both head to the bathroom. I wait for her outside the entrance of the toilet. Another couple of girls go into the bathroom, but I don't pay much attention to that. A few minutes go by and I start getting very annoyed because I didn't want to lose the party. Another five minutes. I was pissed off. I turned around and ended in the bathroom. I heard the sound of her chains moving around, but I can't really tell from which bathroom it comes from, so I knock on every door. No response. I get to the ground and look through the spot between the door and the floor to understand where the noise is coming from, and I find it. Strangely, I see that she isn't alone in the room. I raise my voice and ask if she's okay, and who's that girl? No reply. I start trying to open the door. We couldn't lock the door, so someone had to keep it closed somehow. I start panicking and screaming, and after I try with all the force a seven-year-old can muster, I open it slightly. From now on, I have some confused memories, but I'll try to explain myself the best I can. I see a girl, and I knew her. She was the teenage sister of one of our classmates. I asked her what was happening, and she told me that Sarah was having some problems and she was helping her. But I didn't hear Sarah anymore. I tickled her ankle slash leg and managed to get into the bathroom. I was scared as hell and just wanted my friends back. As I get into the bathroom, she closes it again using her back to keep it closed. I look at Sarah, and she was sitting on the toilet with her face red and the chains on her neck. 
She was slowly choking. I begin to scream, and that chick slaps me. I was sobbing, crying, and basically, I wasn't able to move because of the fear. All I could do was scream as loud as possible again. A teacher finally arrives and gets me and Sarah out of there. She calls our parents and the ambulance, and my parents bring me home while Sarah goes to the hospital. Turns out that her brother, our classmate, was pissed off by her, and his sister decided to do something about it. She was a lot older than us at the time. I still get chills thinking about what happened, but I've never seen cops talking to my parents or at school, so I guess she got away with it. Me and Sarah never talked about it ever again, and when I try to ask her what happened, she just doesn't want to talk about it. Halloween night several years ago, I was followed home by a stranger. I worked at a large mall about an hour away from home. The stores closed at 10 p.m. and the only bus home ran every hour and only dropped me off two thirds of the way home and I would have to walk the rest. This usually happened between 11 to 1 a.m. at night, depending on if I could get the store closed down on time and if the bus wasn't too packed for me to get on. I'm not a small woman. I'm fairly tall and fairly round and not particularly attractive. My uniform was just a polo shirt and black trousers, flat shoes, all covered with a thick coat. I didn't see him get on the bus. To be fair, the bus was packed and noisy, and the walkways were crowded, and I did my best to just block it all out with my headphones, and while I was staring out the window. I'm not a people person, and having been to work for 12 hours on a busy day, surrounded by these same assholes, I was just pissed off and desperate to get off the bus and be alone. When we finally got to my stop and I managed to struggle my way out of the front of the bus through people that refused to move, I stumbled into the night air and breathed a sigh of relief. A couple of people got off the bus behind me and I started up the hill crossing the road to continue up the side of the street that led to my road. This side street is very long and has offshoots into residential streets on very steep hills going down. The street itself is lined with small shops, and there's a high grassy bank on the opposite side that has houses along the top, so it feels very isolated after the shops close. Very few people get off at my bus stop this time of night, and even fewer head in the same direction. Those that do cut off and go down one of these hills, long before I get to the hill that leads up to my building. Now the street isn't very well lit. The street lamps are few and far between. Several of them are motion activated, so don't even turn on until you're right on top of them. I've walked home in the dark this way a thousand times, and I've walked to work this way at 3 to 4 a.m. in the morning a thousand times too, for a different job. Whilst I always enjoy the cool night air, I'm not afraid of the dark and love how bright the stars are where I live. I don't loiter. I walk as fast as I can, get home, and then shower as soon as possible. This night, I noticed someone walking behind me. I usually do because, like I stated above, very few people walk this way at this time of night. I was aware of him and waiting for him to turn down one of these side streets. He didn't. It felt weird, but I'm not the only person that lives in the area, so maybe he just isn't regularly walking this way at this time of night, so I've just never seen him before. I get to the medical surgery and car park at the bottom of my hill and cut across it as always. At this point, I know that if he also heads up my hill, I need to worry a little more. This hill goes alongside the surgery, and then there are high walls on my side of the street that block off the flats on the other side of my road. They can only be accessed from the road before mine. At the top of the hill, this wall ends and turns into an alley that runs parallel to my building. The opposite side of the road has multiple closed pubs a closed corner store, and an old church that has been converted into a Muslim worship center, which is also closed. There are even less street lamps here, and my building is surrounded by a metal fence, with 20 or so feet of grass that slopes down to the entrance of the building where the doorway is lit up. The point is, it's isolated, and the only reason that someone should be up here at this time of night is if they live in my building. 
This guy crosses the car park after me, and now I'm feeling concerned. I know he doesn't live in my building. There are nine flats over three floors and ten people. I know all of them, and they know me. We would recognize each other even in this level of darkness. So I walk faster up the hill, hoping to get in the building before he catches up. He starts walking faster, too. I can hear him gaining on me, and by the time I get to the gate, I know he's too close for me to be able to open the door and get inside before he's on me. The building is dark, and I know everyone is in bed, and it makes me feel all alone. And at this point, I'm crapping myself. So thinking quickly, I cross the road and walk further up the hill behind parked cars. I use the opportunity to swing my backpack off of one shoulder and grab my keys. I wait for him to follow me and get behind the cars too, so it'll take just a little bit longer for him to be able to cross back over before I bolt across the road, throwing open the gate. I swing it hard behind me because he's now running at me, and I think it'll either latch before he can catch it or it'll hit him. Either way, it'll buy me a few seconds. I slide down the slope, barely staying on my feet because it's dangerously slippery when it's wet. I turn the corner at the bottom and slam my keycard on the reader, pressing hard on the heavy door before it beeps so it'll open that much faster. The door is heavy, and on a fire safety hinge that means I can't slam it or force it closed. The stairs are a couple of steps into the building and to the left. I live on the top floor. It's not a big building, three flats on each other, two flights of stairs. It's also a concrete stairwell, so every little sound echoes and can be heard behind closed doors. I get inside the building and immediately bolt up the stairs. I'm only a few steps up when the door flies open behind me and this guy comes after me. Feeling a little more secure now, I'm in my building and only feet away from my neighbors. I spin around before he reaches me and slam my heavy backpack into him. He falls back to the landing and manages to catch himself by grabbing hold of the handrail. I scream what the fuck at the top of my lungs and hold my bag in front of me. Now we're inside, and the stairwell is lit by the motion-activated lights. I get my first proper look at him. He's a little taller than me. I'm five foot eight. He's African American and old enough to be graying. His clothes are weird, all made out of that weird waxy material some weatherproof jackets are, and he's wearing heavy boots. I don't recognize him at all and he looks up at me with wide eyes as I stare down at him. I'm fully prepared to kick him in the face and throw my bag if I have to. I don't want him to be able to follow me into my flat, so I stare him down. He begins to stutter, hands ringing over the handrail and ducking his head a little, trying to look pathetic and harmless. He mutters something about visiting his son. Like I stated before, nine people other than me live in this building. At the time, none of them were African-American, and none of them, other than myself, were young enough for him to be their parent. Even if his son did live here, how would he know to follow me off the bus and get to my building? Why did he follow me when I moved away from my building? And why did he chase me? He could have walked to the building and buzzed up to his son for him to let him in if it was true. I began shouting at him to get out, repeating those two words over and over again, sprinkling in, I don't know you and you don't live here. He continues muttering, making his excuses, but I shout over him when I hear neighbors moving around and coming towards their doors, probably to look through their peepholes. I begin to back up the stairs. My neighbor, right at the bottom of the stairs behind the man, opens her door leaving her chain on and peering through at us. She asks me if I'm okay and if she needs to call the police. The guy spins to stare at her, his hands out in a stop motion and I hear another neighbor open his door behind the stairs, also on the ground floor. He calls out to ask if everything is okay too, and I just yell out to both of them. He followed me home. I don't know him. He won't leave. I'm now at the top of the first set of stairs still looking down at him. My male neighbor starts to tell him to get the fuck out, either more intimidated by the man than he was me, or realizing that he was outnumbered. He begins trying to open the front door, you have to press a button to get it open, and he clearly doesn't know this. Further evidence that he's never been here before. Feeling more secure now that I'm not alone and he's trying to leave, I bolt across the landing and up the final flight of stairs, and get my door open before locking it behind me. I was dripping sweat, and very close to a panic attack. I dragged my hoover to the front door and propped it up. Just in case someone tried to open my door, I would hear the hoover fall. I didn't sleep very well at all, listening to every sound in the building, 
and luckily I didn't have to work the next day. I woke up about 6 a.m. to a lot of sound in the building's landings. I could hear people opening every bin chute room and coming back out again. I peered through my peephole to see uniformed policemen searching the common areas of the building. I didn't call the police, but I assume one of the neighbors downstairs did. The bin rooms are fairly large, so I imagine they were checking to see if someone was hiding. I don't know for sure and I didn't ask. Other than asking me if I was okay when we saw each other next, the neighbors that helped on that night never said anything else about it. I don't know who he was or what he wanted. I've never seen him again, and I've stopped working at that shopping center a couple of years later. I do feel guilty for not calling the police, just in case he had done this before or since, and the woman didn't manage to get away. But at the time, I just wanted to forget about it and move forward. This incident happened to me last year on Halloween. My little brother and I were home alone since our parents had gone out to a Halloween party. They had tasked us with handing out candy to the trick-or-treaters. This bummed my brother and I out because we had made plans to go trick-or-treating with a few friends. Our parents told us that we were too old to be still trick-or-treating and that we could instead invite our friends over to the house and hang out there. My friends declined my invitation to come over because they still wanted to go trick-or-treating so that left me home alone with my brother handing out candy. A lot of people stopped by our house, and by 10 o'clock, almost all of the candy was gone. My brother and I decided that we'd eat the rest. We were sitting out on the couch, watching a scary movie, stuffing ourselves with candy, when there was a knock at the door. I stormed off the couch, wondering who the hell could be knocking on our door this late. I assumed that it was just some late-night trick-or-treaters. Even if that was the case, I had turned the porch light and Halloween decorations off, which should have been a dead giveaway that we were out of candy or that we weren't home, so I assumed it was my parents. Being cautious, I looked through the peephole and saw a suspicious man standing on our front porch. He was wearing a black hoodie with the hood over his head, which made it difficult to see his face. The only detail of his face that I could spot was that he had a beard and dry, crusty lips. There was no way that this guy was a trick-or-treater because he wasn't wearing a costume and was far too old to be trick-or-treating alone. His hands were stuffed in the front pocket of his hoodie and he also looked very thin. Every single red flag went off in my head about this guy. There was no way in hell I was going to open the door. Still looking through the peephole, I watched as he knocked on the door again. He seemed desperate for us to open the door and was shaking a bit. It wasn't cold outside, definitely not cold enough for someone to be trembling. He was giving me a bad vibe, and I wanted to get rid of him as soon as possible. We're out of candy, I shouted to him. I watched as a smile spread across his face. It wasn't a friendly smile either. Are you alone in there? The man asked almost in a mocking voice. His voice was raspy and dry. Should I call the police? My little brother asked me quietly, gripping his cell phone. The man let out a low grumble and said, Sounds like you're not alone in there. I continued to watch him through the peephole. His hands were still wedged tightly in his pocket, and he was still shaking a bit. I began to wonder if he was armed. I decided to take action, and spoke to him in the most intimidating voice I could. Get the fuck away from my house or I'll call the police, I shouted. His smile faded, and he bared his teeth. His teeth were yellow and I concluded that he was probably some homeless crackhead. He had a look of fury plastered on his face. Fortunately, he left without trying to break in, probably because he knew that I wasn't messing around with him. I didn't stop watching him through the peephole until I saw him completely off of our property. My brother and I breathed a sigh of relief and decided that we didn't need to call the police since he was gone. My brother and I were a bit paranoid after this and watched TV until our parents came home. We didn't tell them about the man since he hadn't really tried to harm us. Now when I think back to this, I wish we had called the police. Because maybe we would have been able to prevent a murder. You see, the next day, we found out that the elderly woman who lived a few houses down from us had been brutally murdered. Her neighbor had found her lying out on her front porch, covered in blood. 
She had been stabbed multiple times in the chest and neck. My brother and I immediately knew who had done it, and we told the police what we knew. They couldn't do much from the information we had given them, since we hadn't seen many of the details of his face. They went on to hunt for the man, but never caught him. I blame myself for that poor old lady's murder, because I could have prevented it from happening just by calling the police. I think the most disturbing thing of all is the fact that he didn't take anything from the old lady's house. Her home had been left untouched, but he could have gone in and taken what he wanted since her door was wide open. This means that he just wanted to kill. That was his only intention. He didn't want money or jewelry. His only urge was to murder. Halloween is my favorite holiday. Is, not was. Even despite the events that unfolded one crisp Hallow's Eve when I was about 16. At the time, I lived with my parents, younger brother, older stepbrother, and cousin, in a big but old house that sat in a cul-de-sac close to Main Street. Behind it ran an alleyway flanked by apartments, and it had a huge yard that my basement bedroom looked out on. We lived in a small town, Crime seemed minimal in the area, and I'd made my way out that Halloween night to make the most out of the best day of the year. It wasn't just what happened that night, though. It was, of course, what came after, and one small incident that came before. A few days before Halloween, my stepbrother and cousin arrived home to discover a pickup truck full of dudes taking photos of our house. Weird, but when approached, the men seemed friendly and complimented our Halloween setup. It was pretty great, that is true. The men sped off without incident and were quickly forgotten. My stepbrother and cousin re-entered the story Halloween night, the big event itself, at about 3 a.m. Both had been out drinking with their friends, and as such, both had left their respective vehicles and braved the icy walk back home on their own. My cousin arrived home first, but couldn't seem to get his key in the lock, so just sat on the front porch bench and waited for my stepbrother to show up. He did about half an hour later. After having a bit of a laugh at my cousin for being an uncoordinated goober, he went to unlock the door himself. And no luck. So they bit the bullet and called my mom, waking her up to let them in. She was, of course, unimpressed to be opening the door for a pair of drunken idiots at this time of night, and didn't buy their story about the wonky lock. They insisted, though, and to shut them up, she finally relented and tried her key, she too could not get her key in the lock. Annoyed, tired, and now just confused, she wrote it off as a problem for tomorrow, and the three of them hit their respective hay. One other person arrived home late that night, me, though I arrived much later than those two and was in bed by about midnight. I woke up close to 1 a.m., still tired. All I could feel was anxiety, and I didn't know why. At first, I tried to sell myself that I had just gotten a bit too into the holiday spirit and had psyched myself out. But then I noticed a shadow. It was perfectly man-shaped and cast upon my window. I turned on my bedside lamp, blinked and it was gone. It wasn't unusual, mind you, to see the shadows of people harmlessly walking through the alley. And I told myself that's all there was to it. Then there was what happened after. I came home from school the next day. My parents were there. So was a locksmith and so were the police. My parents were there because, well, that's where they lived. The locksmith was there because my mother had called him, as the confusion over the broken lock persisted. The cops were there because the locksmith and my parents had both called them, when the locksmith proceeded to pull the tip of a knife out of our lock. I was relieved to see that's where the knife tip ended up, as they discovered two of our window screens had been slashed, one on our garage, and the other, my bedroom window. On 
All right. So this happened my junior year of high school. One of my best friends invited me to a Halloween party at her house with our school friends and some of her friends from a previous school. When I got there, I was wearing a poor iteration of Tom Cruise and Top Gun. My friend introduced me to this girl, and we actually hit it off really well. She told me that my friend had told her a lot about me, and that they knew each other through their parents' work. We started talking about our interests and were decently flirty with each other. Now I had gotten out of my first real relationship earlier that year, and I was not one to hop around from girl to girl. So being really flirty with someone on my first time meeting with them was not something that I was used to doing. At the end of the night, we were sitting on the ground floor of my friend's house and we ended up kissing for a little bit, which again was moving really, really fast for me. We started texting after that, but it kind of had a weird feeling about her and couldn't really see myself being in a relationship with her. But prior to realizing that, we had made plans for a date with my friend who threw the party and her boyfriend. When the day of the date came, I had come down with a 101.7 degree fever and felt very, very out of it. I called and explained to her that I was sick and was extremely sorry, but I wouldn't be able to make it to the date. This was a solid three or four hours before we were supposed to meet, so I wasn't pulling this last minute. Her response kicked off the most backward period of my entire high school life. She responded by saying, well, I wasn't going to tell you this earlier, but I have brain cancer. Brain cancer. So I don't have much time to go on dates. The strangest part was she asked me to not tell anyone about it at all. She stated this was because her father didn't want to use her cancer as a way to work people over to get stuff, which I found odd. Now a little backstory. I had a football coach who had passed away of cancer, and my friend's mom the friend who threw the party, also developed cancer around that time. So the topic of cancer was heavy on my heart, and I felt incredible guilt, and being the emotionally charged person I am, I decided to go out on the date. During the date, she started saying that she really appreciated me coming, and the way that I treated her. This made me feel better knowing that I was helping. At a point near the end of the date, we were walking towards my car, when she again brought up that she appreciated the way that I treat her. She followed it up by explaining that she wasn't used to guys treating her right because she was essayed when she was younger and actually had to have an abortion due to a forced pregnancy at the hand of a male relative of hers. My heart broke for her as she sounded like she had endured a lot of hardship on top of the fact that she was going to supposedly pass away from cancer in the next year. I was an emotional wreck following the date because it was a lot for me to take on, but I knew that if I all of the sudden stopped talking to her, I would never forgive myself. At this point, I had a small sense of suspicion of things that she had told me, especially the part about not telling anyone under any circumstances. That, coupled with a couple of things that she had said on our dates so far, regarding what she wanted to do with her future, and saying things like, I wanna try out blank hairstyle when I get older, after she said these things, she seemed to tense up a bit, but I chalked it up to her coming to terms with the fact that she wouldn't be able to do any of these things. My suspicions grew and grew, and eventually, I decided to try and do some investigating. Her father was a doctor at the place where I went for doctor things, and my personal doctor was a family friend of mine, who knew her father very well. I asked her if there was anything I could do to support or help her regarding her cancer. My doctor looked at me and said, what cancer? She doesn't have cancer. I immediately became filled with anger and texting her telling her what I had learned. A day before, she had called me to let me know that her diagnosis was a mistake, but her tone was very melodramatic and not at all what you would expect as a response to finding out that you didn't have a deadly disease. She tried to cover her tracks and was asking me why I would question her and was saying, I thought you cared about me. I am livid, and I block her on everything, and I block her number. I also fall into a pretty deep depression for the next week or so, because of how much I was yanked around by this girl, and this intersection led me to have a major trust issues with women, which I still have not gotten over. A couple of weeks later, I get a Facebook message request from a name that I didn't recognize. It was her. She had made a fake profile, and was telling me that I was being super immature, and told me that she has some explaining to do. 
No duh. I of course didn't answer. And that was the last that I had ever heard of her. Until a year and a half later, I had signed up for an ACT retake exam at my local university. And when I got there and sat down, I looked one row in front of me and about three seats to the right. And guess who was there? We ended up talking and she apologized for everything that she had did in a relatively believable manner. And I forgave her. I never found out if any of the other things she had told me about her home life were true, but I made sure to avoid her at all costs, which was a pain because she worked at Coldstone and that was two minutes away from my house. I had to go to the one downtown. I came across her real Facebook profile recently and she seems to be doing well, which I'm glad to see. But as far as our interaction goes, I don't want to hang out with her anymore and I definitely don't want to see her again. This happened during my college's Halloween celebration a few years ago and is the most terrifying experience of my life. One of my roommates, some friends, and myself left to go to a party around dusk and we were catcalled by a group of three drifters slash homeless people. We thought nothing of it and went on our merry way. About four hours later, we're going back to our apartment to change shoes. High heels and messed up streets are hell when you've been drinking. When one of the drifters calls out to me, Hey beautiful, how about a kiss? Me being a little drunk and sassy, I reply, No thanks, girls are more my type. To my shock and horror, he says, Hey, my friend here likes the ladies. A homeless girl comes out of nowhere and proceeds to kiss me on the mouth. My friend picks me up and throws me over his shoulder. I proceed to flip out in my apartment, shrug it off, and we venture back out. Well, I got separated from my group in the crowd, and then I see the three drifters again. I try not to show that I'm shitting bricks when they ask me where they can find a liquor store. I point down the street to the Kroger, and they say, Okay, you can show us. I'm a small woman, and they shove me into their vehicle. I think naively at the time that they will literally let me out of the grocery store, except it's closed because it's after midnight. I plead for them to let me out of the car, but they keep saying, the power does what it wants, and headed away from the safety of the campus area, onto the freeway, and out of the state. For the next four hours, I visited three states with them while pleading for my life. I'll never forget how they kept saying, the power does what it wants, and talking about how they're going to have fun with me. I kind of resigned myself to the fact that I was going to die that I would never graduate college or see my family again. They pulled into a gas station and I slipped out of the vehicle to be grabbed again, but I screamed my head off for the clerk to help. That's when they talked about taking me to the cliff. I mentioned that my family is full of police officers and that they're probably already looking for me, how they're committing a federal crime and that I won't press charges if they take me back to campus. I guess that's when the girl started to feel sorry for me because she started to say, Guys, she's really scared. Maybe we should just drop her off somewhere. This doesn't have to get any worse. They took me back to the campus area. And as soon as the girl pulled me out of the car, a police officer called my name. The girl shoved me towards the cop and yelled, The power does what it wants, and tonight it let you live. I've never been so happy to sit in a cruiser. They pursued them, but I don't know if they were ever caught. My roommate dropped out of college and joined the military, and I transferred to another school. So ladies and gentlemen, please be careful walking at night. Always keep your cell phone with you if possible, and call the police if you see suspicious people near your apartment. I had a brush with death that day, and I'm so grateful for the time that I have now. This could have been written better, but it's still hard to talk about.
this happened back in 2014. I went out on a night for Halloween during my first year of university. I was wearing high-heeled boots and a leather jacket. Over the course of the night, drunk me had taken them off and left them at our group's table due to being uncomfortable. By the end of the night, I'd practically danced my way to near sobriety and I went to my group's table. However, they'd given up the table and my boots and jacket were nowhere to be seen. Someone had stolen them. Whatever, they weren't expensive and I rarely wore them anyway. Now. However. I had to walk the 15 minutes back to my accommodation. I didn't have money for a taxi, so I thought I'd just walk slowly. I asked one guy, the asshole in the group that everyone hated, if he could just keep me company because he was tall. He laughed, said no, and walked off, dragging the only girl who was also shoeless with him. So I was walking alone, shoeless in a busy city center, watching out for broken glass or anything else that was harmful or disgusting. Everyone else was so far ahead that I couldn't even see them, but I just kept going. I was halfway to my place when I was stopped by a Middle Eastern man. The city was very culturally diverse. He asked if I was okay, and I was grateful that someone cared enough to make sure that I was alright. He offered to help me walk home, so I accepted for at least part of the way. He was very kind and told me his name was Omar. He started saying how beautiful he thought I was, and how lucky he was to have found me, which unsettled me slightly. Once I was around the corner from my place, I thanked Omar and said I'd walk the rest of the way on my own. He instantly looked offended. Don't you want to invite me in for a cup of tea to thank me? I told him no because I don't know him. He kept hold of my wrist. Well, can I have a kiss for helping you? Again, I declined and his grip tightened. Well, do I get a hug for being your friend? By this point, I just wanted to let go, so I gingerly gave him a hug. He then grabbed me and tried to kiss me, but I pressed my lips together, and instead, he just licked up my face. I finally get free and start walking away. He follows me. I speed up and so does he. I abandon my check for glass on the floor and begin sprinting, now terrified as I hear him running too. I get out and call my friend Rob, who I beg to help me. Omar is no longer following me, but I needed someone to keep me safe. He agrees and gets to my flat not long after I do with a knife in case Omar was still there. I told the people in my group, and they were mortified that they'd left me alone. I returned home for a week because I was thoroughly shook up. Now, on a night out, I make sure everyone is close by so it doesn't happen again to me or anyone else. Oh, and Omar. Let's not meet. This took place in fall of 2008, at the college that I used to go to. It was Halloween week and my friends and I decided to dress up and have a little party with cupcakes and punch on campus. We were all laughing and taking pictures, and I turned around and there was this guy who just showed up out of nowhere. I said hi and we made small chit chat. He turns out to be an okay guy, and a few of my friends said that he was single, and that I should see where it goes. He was tall. Six foot two, broad, black hair, and charming. We had a lot in common, so we decided to go to the movies together. But we had to make a stop at his place to pick up some money. We get to his place and ended up drinking, listening to music, and before I knew it, we were having sex. He was attentive, and the passionate hugging was rough and well. It was great. I don't normally sleep well at night, so while he slept, I decided to get on his laptop and check my mail and watch YouTube videos. Not long was I on his laptop that I hear this tingling from his window. I couldn't see who it was, considering the blinds and it being pitch black in his room. I go over to Jared, whispering, to tell him that there's someone at his window calling his name. He whispers back, saying he knows, and told me to put my laptop away slowly, and lay down till she goes. She kept trying to get into his apartment, but the door was locked. She kept banging on the door saying, where is Jared? Eventually she gave up and went away. 
The next day, I asked him who that was, and he said his girlfriend. I got my stuff and left. He kept saying that he would leave her for me, but I didn't want to be with someone like that. So, I thought it was over, but he kept calling me, saying he loved me and that he needs me to live. He kept showing up to my classes. I eventually told my guy friends to tell him to leave me alone. He did, and I thought that was the last that I heard of him. He was still friends with some of my friends, which didn't bother me, just as long as he ignored me. Two of my friends went over to his apartment because he kept leaving suicidal messages on their phones. They said that they came to a trashed apartment, broke bottles in the bathroom and blood on the walls with my name and I love her written all over his bedroom, drunk. My friends called to tell me this and to please carry protection with me at all times. He tried to come back twice. One incident, he yelled from a bus from college, waiting to leave that I had better not block him on Facebook or else. I found his profile and blocked him immediately. The last time I saw him, he snuck up behind me while I was waiting for the bus downtown, and I ran from the bus stop back to the nearby coffee shop. That is one creep that I never want to see again. Before we head into the two hours of rain at the end of this video, I want to thank all of our channel members. So thank you so much to Vanita Tillman, Jennifer Moyer, Sonic the Hedgehog, Chili MC, Cutie Patootie, Cappy Karma, Pamela Curin, Christy Goodall, Paul Reese, Thea Mash K0101, Honey Pond, Bitchy Betty, Down Below, Diane Genius, and Inner Scare Wifey. Thank you guys so much for being members. I appreciate y'all so much. Happy Halloween, everybody. Remember, be safe out there. Have fun during this spooky season. And most of all, good night.